Okay, good morning, everyone. Welcome to Journal Club for uh, April. Uh, we start with the land acknowledgement and recognize that many Indigenous nations have longstanding relationships with the land upon which the work of the University of Toronto's Department of Medicine is conducted. We acknowledge our presence on the traditional territory of many Indigenous nations, including the Mississauga, the Credit, the Anishinaabeg, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples. Today, this land is home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit and Métis peoples, and we are grateful to have the opportunity to live, work, and gather on these territories. Land acknowledgements are only a starting point for larger conversations. More concrete acts of restitution and transformation are needed to address underlying inequities and blatant discrimination in the distribution of resources between Canada's First Peoples and settlers. We have two exciting presentations this morning showcasing uh, fellows within the Division of Geriatric Medicine. Uh, our fellows uh, do not uh, routinely rotate between sites, so allow me uh, a few introductions. First to speak is Dr. Annabelle uh, Gagne. Annabelle has an undergraduate degree in physiotherapy from Sherbrooke University and completed her medical training internal medicine and geriatric medicine subspecialty training at Laval University in Quebec City. She is two months away from completing a geriatric rehabilitation fellowship here at U of T and has plans to practice at an academic center on the south shore of Quebec City, uh, the historic Levy, uh, Quebec. She will present on the diagnostic yield of CP head in delirium and altered mental status, a systematic review and meta-analysis. Annabelle, welcome. And let me share my screen. Yes. Perfect. Okay. Good morning, everyone. So let's start. I have a couple of slides to present to you this morning. So, so the article that I'm going to present you was from a group from McGill University in Montreal. It was presented and published in the JAGS in October 2022. So I have no conflicts of interest, except that I chose an, an article from the province of Quebec, where I'm from. In terms of the outline, it was, it was, it's going to be a regular like presentation regarding the article. So let's start with a little bit of background from that we, all things that we already know, I think, regarding delirium, but it's a good refresher for a brain. So we know that delirium is the most common neurological disorder in the hospitalized setting. You know, we know that the occurrence of delirium in a hospital is estimated to 23% in all comers, and that there is an higher incidence in the elderly with ranges between 30 to 60% and can go up to 70% 70, 70 in cl clinical care settings. So we also know that delirium has a negative impact on several clinical outcomes, including higher mortality rates, more medical complications, increased likelihood on being discharged to a skilled nursing facility, longer length of hospital stay, and increased costs for the healthcare system. And unfortunately, it's still unrecognized, and the cause or the ideology of the delirium not always entirely apparent, even nowadays. We also observe in the past years that there are some use and overuse of CT CT scan, and it's been, it's, it has become a well-described challenge in the healthcare system. And in the US only, there is over 75 millions of CT scans that are ordered annually, which is a lot. And we, in some studies, prior, previous studies, we have observed that it's, there's a highly variable sensitivity of the CT head for diagnostic ideology of delirium and, and altered mental status that could be as low as zero to four percent. My mouse is stuck here. And routine ordering of CT head in delirium can lead to unfortunately increased demands on the radiology department, unnecessary transports of patient, potentially harmful use of sedation for agitated patient was actually observed in a study and lost opportunity costs. So the aim of this study was to understand the trends and overall diagnostic yield of CT head in patient with delirium and AMS. And what also to identify, identify any clinical factors that increase the ideologic yield of CT head in delirium. 
In terms of meta methodology, so they use a MOOCs criteria and a Prisma, Prisma statement. In terms of data source and source strategy, they use different databases, which are outlined here. And the search strategy was actually designed by an experienced hospital librarian and was peer reviewed by a second librarian to make sure they got all the articles. There was no language limit and no year limit for the search. In terms of the inclusion criteria for the article, so they had to be original investigation, observation, observational studies, the location would have to be ED inpatient or an intensive care units, and the population had to be delirium or AMS or subpopulation. The exclusion criteria were case reports or case series. If the city had was performing a trauma population because the trauma population, they, we have a, already have a rule about prescribing CT head in context of ABI, like that is called the Canadian CT head rule. So that's why it, the, the, it was excluded. And they also excluded exclusively false population. So in terms of review, they, they, they had two reviewers who independently extracted data and the discrete discrepancies resolved by consensus and a third viewer. The primary outcome was the yield of an abnormal CT head finding. The abnormal CT head was defined according to the individual studies, which was acute or subacute stroke, hemorrhage, tumor or edema, herniation, infection, abscess or space occupying lesion. The risk of bias from the study was were evaluated with the Robbins E in a grade system. And actually they, they like they dispatched the studies in four different categories depending on the population of the study. So the first category was delirium, a diagnosis of delirium with or without the CAM criteria. The category two was altered mental status in medical patient. The, the third category was a very, very broad medical population that included like different like population like delirium, AMS, non-focal deficit, seizures, syncope, headache, vertigo or dizziness and dementia. And the fourth category was any of the above, but with the presence of focal neurological deficits that was in the studies. They also did some quali qualitative surge. So they, they looked at studies as well that reported factors associated with an increase or decrease CT head heal for investigation of theorem or AMS. In terms of the results, so after the duplicates were removed, it's over 9,000 studies that were that that were searched. And so in regards to the records that were screened, so it was over 8,000 records that was that, that were screened, and there was 126 full text articles that were assessed for eligibility. So, and 80 were excluded, primary, primarily because of non representativeness of the patient population. In total, it was 40, 46 studies that were included. In terms of the table one, so they show all of the studies that were included, which was a lot. So 46 studies. And in these studies, so their enrollment year ranged from 1984 to 2017. So the number of scans per study was were very different, ranging from nine scans to over 4,000 scans. And most of the studies that we can see here for the risk of bias were at high risk of bias. We see it here, so I, I risk or very, very high risk of bias. In terms of, so in time, terms of the type of the study, there was 37 retrospective cohort studies, six pro prospective cohort studies, and three with prospective and retrospective cohorts. The diagnosis of delirium was mainly made by the clinician without the use of a standardized delirium assessment tool for most of the studies. There was 31 studies that assessed factors, predictors of abnormal CT head, and there was eight studies that developed or tested a clinical scoring system or predictive model for, to safely decrease the use of CT scan in the investigation of that. <clears throat> 
So it was over 20,000 patients that were included. So most of the patients were coming from ED or inpatient, and the other one were other ones were coming from the ICU, the other studies. The mean age was in most studies was over 60 years old. And in terms of the different categories here, so we can see that most of the studies were performed uh, with like this very gray definition of altered mental status. There were four studies with delirium, seven studies with the, the medical patient, and 15 studies with focal neurolog neurological deficits. In terms of the full yield of diagnosis for the inpatient and ED population, so, so patients, so the full yield of diagnostic yield for the HUD city was 12.9, so close to 13% for the HUD city, which is very, very low. And with in, in confidence interval of ranging from 10% to 16% around that. And it was considerable heterogeneity of 96%. And for the ICU population, the pool year was 17.4 with confidence interval ranging from 10 to 26%. Once again, significant heterogeneity between the studies. So they try to subdivide for the ice for I'm, I'm sorry, this is a crowded slide, but figured it was more nicer to compare all of that together on the same side. So for the inpatient and the ED sub, subpopulation, what they did is they compared the diagnostic yield depending of the category of the patient, how they divided their study. So if we look at the delirium only subpopulation, so the diagnostic yield was around 10%. For the third category, which was altered mental status, it was around the same 10.86. For the third category, which was the brown medical population, around 9%. And for the fourth category with focal neurological deficit, around more 13%. So we, we, we see that there's a trend towards more like increased diagnostic yield for the focal FND population, but, but there was no statistically significant differences between the categories. In terms of the qualitative findings, so it's, it's, I think it's stuff that we already know. So the predictors of abnormal CT findings were older age, altered mental status, presence of focal neurological deficit, which was the most reliable and most significant between all of the study, headache with nausea and vomiting, use of anticoagulation, but I would say like one study reported the opposite, the severely decreased LOC, history of a fall, or unusual at age. Some factors associated with a normal CT had was a delirium in the absence of FND, sepsis, absent FND along with fever or dehydration, the presence of an alternative diagnosis, and pre existing dem dementia as well. In terms um, of the other qualitative findings, so the, in regards to the score to reduce unnecessary scans, they said that it could reduce up to 15 to 35% the use of CT had. The most recent one was developed in 2019, but it was developed with a very broad population in these studies, including AMS, delirium, seizure, headache, dizziness, vertigo. So we cannot really like really use them right now in our day-to-day -day clinical practice. So in terms of like in like nice discussion point. So what has been observed over time? So we know that there is a general tendency for healthcare providers to order CT imaging as increased over time. If we compare the diagnostic yield of the CT head in the two population, two places, so in ED inpatient versus ICU patient, the overall yield was lower in the ED inpatient, one in every eight compared to one in every five. In regards to lo localization, so the scan that was done in East Asia compared to North America, there was a higher diagnostic yield for the East Asia going up to uh, at least 20, 
up to 26%. And another interesting fact is that the studies published in 2000 or prior had a higher diagnostic real, yield as well, around 20% compared to after 2000, which was around 11%. So the CT had cannot replace the clinical judgment and the physical exam. In terms of the critical, critical appraisal of the study, so everything was done like very was very well done in terms of the strength. So what's what are what's important to to say with this study is that it's quite a, quite of a pertinent question. I think it was nice for them to include of many studies from ver various clinical settings. There was a broad search strategy with no language restriction, no year restriction. And the, the qualitative part of the study for me as a clinician was a good reminder of what I should look for before ordering a CD scan in the, manage, in the investigation workup of the data. In terms of limitation, of course, it was observational studies with high risk of bias, and most studies did, did not adjust for confounding factors, but the yield among the studies at low risk of bias was like, compared to high risk of bias was very similar. There was a high degree of heterogeneity that limits the conclusion that can be drawn from this, from this article. In, the, in some of the study, there, there was a, as well a lack of follow-up for the patient that did not have a CT scan. And there was a very a high variability in the diagnosis of, del of delirium using the CAM scale or no scale, and we, we don't know. So it was made by a clinician, but was it made by an emergency department doctor? Was it made by a geriatrician? So we don't know. So in terms of summary, what we should like know from the study is that the diagnostic yield of HUD CT for detection of abnormalities contributing to delirium or AMS in non-critical care settings was 13%, which was very low. The, having a focal neurological disorder deficit does increase the yield of CD scan in investigating the, the, the etiology for the delirium. And probably we need some guidelines and decision support tools that could improve appropriate of ordering of CD HUD especially in certain places like in the, in the emergency department. I'm gonna finish with a question for yourselves as clinician. It's a question that I've asked myself as well when I read this study. And you don't need to answer the, this question, but you can take a couple of seconds to ask yourself, are you ordering too many CT head for the investigation of delirium in your current actual practice? My answer to my question is yes, I feel like sometimes I'm treating more the doctor than the patient while ordering that, especially at during my first year of practice when I before I came to a fellowship. So it, even though the study was more like with observational studies, the diagnostic yield you know, that's very low, it's gonna probably comfort me in not ordering CD scan of head in most of the patients that are admitted for delirium. That was it. Thank you very much. Uh, beautifully presented, uh, fabulous slides uh, as well. And uh, you're right, very common for all of us to encounter uh, on a daily basis. Shabir has uh, his hand up, go ahead. Thanks, Dov. And, and thank you, Annabelle. I echo Dov's comment that it was a very nicely presented paper. Um, I have a comment and a question, or I have two questions for you. One is you say that maybe clinicians, yourself you mentioned, but I think many of us were ordering too many CT heads. I would challenge that because my question to you is how much is too much? If we think that the probability of finding an abnormal CT head is 8%, 11%, 13%, that's not low by many diagnostic criteria where if you have an index of suspicion commonly in clinical practice of one to 5% or higher, we do further testing. And yet what I think you're suggesting is that eight to 13% yield of a CT head is not high enough. And I would disagree with that. And I'd like you to, to defend that a little more. My second question is, it would be great if any of the studies looked at the yield of a CT head when an expert clinician thought they had one or more other clear causes of delirium already, post-operative state, uh, recent toxic medication, hyponatremia, et cetera. Did any of the studies look at that? No, the answer to the second question is that none of the study actually 
looked at that and it was my question but they haven't looked at that and for the first point my my point is with that so i just we just need to remember that the ed cities should not replace a good physical exam a good neurological physical exam on our patient and i think that in my first year of practice i had the tendency of saying oh it's confusing as delirium so i'm just going to make sure there's nothing there even though my my neurological physical exam was normal and the delirium was improving we were like kind of trending towards ordering a cd scan as well which was not maybe not required at this time. But the data don't support that, Annabelle, because the data don't differentiate broadly between abnormal mental status with or without a focal neurologic deficit. The, the yield is slightly lower if there's no focal neurologic deficit. And I'm not saying I love CT scans. I think I order over order them, but I don't think these data give me confidence in saying I should not order them because the yield, even in people with non-specific abnormal mental status, is at least eight percent. That's not a low yield if you had to take it to court. And I don't think the court should be the final determinant of what we do, but sadly, in many cases, it is. That's a great point, and thank you for sharing that. Thank you, and thank you. Yes, and Barry uh, has a, a comment that was liked by several others. It would be nice to know how many of the 13% had management or outcomes changed by that CT. Um, uh, so thank you, Barry, uh, for coming back to Journal Club and, and uh, accumulating likes in your comments. And Michael Gordon, uh, hand up, go ahead. Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure how, how many people in the group have ever worked in the United States. I did one year in the United States after I trained in the UK. And the first thing I was told by a fellow intern when I said, why are we doing this test? Is he said, you have to make sure you're not gonna be sued. So I would suggest that in the United States, CTs are ordered primarily to avoid litigation, which as you know, is America's national pastime. And it would be interesting to see comparing, let's say the United States with Australia, and Canada in terms of CT scans. I do agree with Shabir, you know, that maybe we're not over ordering if we have enough suspicion, but in my own years of practice, most of those were ordered for delirium, which we all knew as clinicians was caused by post-operative medications, et cetera, and the yield was zero. Thank you very much. Thank you for the rich uh, discussion. As a final comment before our next presentation, Dr. Amanda Goldberg, a prior subspecialty resident, I don't think she's on the line this morning, but uh, per, you know, conducted a scholarly activity project, a locally small sample at Sunnybrook that analyzed all the CT scan head that was done on general inpatient, in uh, general internal medicine inpatients, not the ED, just inpatients over one year. 30 of the 400 scans that were done were done for delirium specifically, zero of them change management. So it's local data, small sample, but addresses Barry's uh, uh, question somewhat. Go ahead, Gary, final comment. I need to be mindful of time for a second presenter. Uh, I was struck by the slide that uh, showed uh, a yield of close to 25%, I think in East Asia. And I'm just curious, Annabelle, if there's something in the paper that would explain, are they using better AI than we are that help direct who should get the CT scan? Why do they have such a, a high yield? That's a very great question. And I asked myself, and I tried to read this supplementary appendix as well, and they did not mention that. So we're not sure. Well, it'd be nice if we can get some of that uh, special sauce. Uh... Yeah, the, the, the question was, they, there was like, or they examine patient first, that might be the reason as well. Or they have less access to CT scans, so they're more like focused on finding a focal neurolog neurological deficit. So when they chose their like CT scan in the correct population. Thank you very much. For the interest of time, we will move on. And please allow me, thank you very much again, uh, Annabelle, for a wonderful presentation. Uh, and comments, please welcome in the chat uh, box. Uh, allow me to introduce our second speaker, Dr. Anna Gross, uh, is an Australian trained physician 
Currently, PGY7, uh, I uh, now learn that training is structurally longer in Australia, and she is completing both specialty training in geriatric and general internal medicine. Dr. Gross is completing a 12-month research fellowship uh, here at U of T in Mount Sinai's Healthy Aging and Geriatrics program. She has also completed policy work with the National Institute of Aging and has a strong interest in medical education. Dr. Gross is also enrolled in a graduate, graduate certificate in clinical education with transition to a master's degree at Flinders University in Australia. Uh, she is here today to present on how to best teach delirium to medical students. Dr. Gross, welcome. Please uh, share your screen. Uh, thank you very much. Um, can you hear me and see my slides okay? Yeah, great. Um, so today I'm presenting a medical education paper from Australia about teaching delirium to undergraduate medical students. Um, uh, the, it's published in the Australasian Journal on Aging, which is the official journal of the Australia and New Zealand Society of Geriatricians, which is probably the Australian equivalent of the Canadian Geriatric Society and the Canadian Geriatrics Journal. And this was published in September of 2022, so last year. I don't have any conflicts of interest to declare, but as mentioned, I do have a keen interest in medical education and I am Australian. So the objectives of today's presentation are to introduce the concept of a group OSCE, which was the interventional um, educational intervention in this study, to describe medical education in Australia as a bit of study context and for general interest, to summarise and critically appraise the study's design and its findings, and to discuss the study's implications for the proposed U of T geriatric medicine clerkship rotation that's in the process of being planned and implemented. So as a bit of study background, as Annabelle mentioned, delirium is really common in hospital, uh, hospitalised patients and it has a complex uh, means of diagnosis and management. Um, medical students should learn about delirium, but this can be challenging in real clinical scenarios that they encounter during their clinical rotations. Simulation methods, therefore, might be an effective way to teach medical students about delirium. And the authors of this paper um, propose that the group objective structured clinical examination or the group OSCE might be a good way uh, that we could teach medical students about delirium. So what is a group OSCE? I'd never heard of it before reading this paper. Um, we're all probably familiar with a summative uh, OSCE that's used to assess students usually at the end of their clinical rotations, whereby there's an examiner that in observes an interaction between a student and either a real patient or a standardised patient. They grade the student against a, a, determined, a predetermined rubric um, uh, and determine whether or not they pass or fail the station. A form, um, a group OSCE is a bit different. It's not a form of assessment um, or it's a formative learning tool and it involves significantly more students. So there's, um, in this study, there were students in group A that interacted with a standardised patient to perform a scenario and there were two delirium related scenarios. Meanwhile, uh, group B uh, students observed um, along with a facilitator, and then Group B students provided formative um, feedback to students in Group A, and then the, then the group swapped. So the students in Group B would participate in the scenario and students in Group A would, would observe. Uh, and both the facilitator and the standardised patient in uh, this paper were uh, geriatrics nurses. So as a bit of context for this study, uh, there are 21 medical schools in Australia and they all either have an undergraduate Bachelor of Medicine, Bachelor of Surgery program or a MD program. The undergraduate degrees last for five to six years or there's um, many universities offer a postgraduate MD program that is four years duration. During medical school, Australian medical students have to have a minimum of two years of clinical experience and rotations covering all the major disciplines. And while many universities have a geriatric medicine rotation and they're quite common, they're not mandatory for medical school accreditation. So they may not exist at all medical schools. We have approximately 3,700 graduating doctors in Australia each year, 
And the main difference with the Canadian training model is that our medical school graduates are undifferentiated. So they all have to complete a 12 month internship where they rotate through uh, medical and surgical specialties, as well as uh, the emergency department. Uh, and then following that, they apply to uh, complete further training in whatever specialty they choose. So bringing it back to this study, the study had two main objectives. The first was to compare the cross-professional facilitated group OSCE, um, which was an educational in intervention with standard delirium teaching uh, that the students received during their geriatrics rotation. And the second objective was to explore differences in the examiner's written feedback between the two groups. So the study utilised a non-randomised clustered controlled design and it took place in Sydney, Australia, uh, at one of the undergraduate um, universities that offered um, a six year medical program. Now this medical school had um, uh, six clinical schools. And so the population was third year medical students at these clinical schools, but they only recruited students from four out of the six clinical schools. And I think what they mean by clinical school is a teaching hospital or teaching hospital network. So at the one university, students were allocated to one of six teaching sites, um, but only on those from four clinical schools were invited to participate in this study. And they used a convenient sampling method. They just emailed all the students at those sites and asked them if they would like to participate. Um, and this took place be just before the group OSCE intervention they were invited to, I'm sorry, before the um, assessment at the end of the year. So the intervention they were testing was, a, was um, predominantly the geriatric nurse specialist led group OSCE, but the students in the intervention group also had um, a small group teaching session led by a geriatric nurse specialist. And then this was compared with the control of standard teaching, which was geriatrician led small group teaching sessions and geriatrician led bedside teaching. However, it wasn't guaranteed that all students would get delirium bedside teaching if there weren't appropriate patients on the ward, for example. The outcomes of this study were student performance in a single delirium case OSCE, and then they um, uh, looked at the quantitative examiner score, as well as the qualitative um, written examiner feedback. There was a single mock OSCE examiner for all students, regardless of whether they're in the intervention or the control group. The examiner used a standard university OSCE grading rubric um, and they were blinded to the students' groups. And the OSCE itself, the station, uh, was approved, was peer reviewed by the university's educational um, committee. So this is a, um, a diagrammatic re representation of the study design. So students uh, were split into either intervention or control group. All of them had a didactic lecture on delirium uh, prior to the start of their clinical placement. Then this um, box highlighted in blue is where the groups differ. So the intervention group had small group teaching by an aged care nurse, as well as the group OSCE, while the control group had small group teaching by a geriatrician and bedside teaching by a geriatrician if there were appropriate patients. Then uh, both groups of students had supervised ward rounds and the opportunity to independently review patients. And then following their four week clinical rotation, they had um, a case method tutorial, which was like a collaborative tutorial where students from multiple sites come together and discuss a delirium case. And then uh, at the end of the academic year, uh, the students were invited to participate in a group, um, I'm sorry, not a group, in a mock um, summative OSCE essentially. Uh, now this clinical rotation, um, the time between the rotation and the end of year um, mock OSCE varied. Uh, so there were four different clinical rotations throughout the year. So some students would have had their um, delirium teaching early in the year, quite far away from the delirium Mokoski, whereas others would have had it um, a lot closer in time. So the quantitative data that was collected was the mock OSCE scores. Uh, the examiner gave students a score out of nine in five different domains on a marking rubric. And then those scores were converted to a total score out of 50 for each student. And then the group's mean scores were compared using the independent samples t-test. The qualitative data consisted of the examiner's comments, which were transcribed and then analysed by a conventional content analysis. There were 159 eligible students uh, across the four clinical schools. 
70 of them replied to the email um, and sat the Mokoski assessment and um, were included. 59% of these were in the group OSCE intervention group and 41% were in the standard teaching control group. The mean time from the completion of their delirium education, so their clinical rotation, to the Mokoski assessment was 14 weeks for both groups with a variation between one and 27 weeks. And we didn't get a breakdown of whether this differed between the two groups. Looking at the results, um, in the intervention group, they did better in the delirium case Mokoski at the end of the year by um, a meet, an average um, increase of 2.7 points. Um, the intervention group mean score was 36.5 out of 50 and the control group was 33.8 and they both had a standard deviation of 2.9. The authors then um, also gave us uh, the quantitative scores in terms of bandings. So um, you'll notice that no student in either group failed the delirium case mock OSCE. Uh, more students in the intervention group achieved a distinction or a high distinction grade than those in the control group. And more students in the control group achieved a pass grade. So overall, the students in the intervention group did seem to do better uh, in the quantitative Mokoski scores. We then um, looked at the examiner comments and three themes were identified by the researchers when they did their content analysis. Uh, so these were follow-up and forward planning, dimension of a team approach, and the mention of care or support by students. And as you can see, uh, the intervention, students in the intervention group more of them um, commented on these things than the students in the control group during their um, Mokoski. So the author's conclusions were that the cross-professional group OSCE is an effective method to increase delirium knowledge, communication and clinical skills compared to conventional education for medical students during their clinical placement. Um, I think this is reasonably valid. However, the authors in this paper focus solely on the group OSCE and there's not really any acknowledgement that the small group teaching session was different in both groups. So um, I would add that the, their intervention included both the nurse-led small group teaching and the group OSCE rather than um, just the, the group OSCE. So moving along to the critical appraisal, uh, did the study address a clearly focused question or issue? I think it did. Is the research method and study design appropriate for answering the question? I think reasonably so, but a randomised design would have been better and including a pre-test component prior to the delirium education intervention would have been valuable to, to completely ensure that students were at the same level uh, prior to the teaching intervention. Uh, were there enough subjects in the study to establish that the findings did not occur by chance? The results were statistically significant with a p-value of uh, less than 0 0.001 for the mean scores. However, the sample size was quite small, uh, meaning that, um, sorry, my lights just got off. The sample size was small, meaning that findings uh, may be unable to be extrapolated. Number four, were subjects randomly allocated to the experimental and control group? And if not, could this have introduced bias? Uh, as mentioned, this was not a randomised study. Uh, so yes, this could have introduced bias. Um, uh, the students were arbitrarily uh, allocated to a group based on which clinical school they attended. And while the authors thought that all the clinical schools were uh, even, we don't have any solid evidence of this. Number five, are objective inclusion and exclusion criteria used? Uh, yeah, reasonably so, I think. Um, the inclusion criteria are quite simple. They were just third year medical students um, at these clinical schools who consented to participate and then completed the, the Mokoski at the end of the year. And the authors didn't really specify any um, exclusion criteria. Number six, were both groups compatible, uncomparable at the start of the study? Um, Yes, the authors argue that they were, but we don't actually have any objective evidence of this. So maybe I should have made this square yellow um, because there was no pre-intervention test. However, it was assumed that all third year medical students at this university, regardless of what clinical school they belong to, would have a standard level of knowledge and neither, none of them had had formal um, delirium training through the university prior to the study. <clears throat> 
Uh, question number seven, were objective and unbiased uh, outcome criteria used? Well, assessments of, a of performance are always somewhat subjective. However, an OSCE is one of the more objective methods of assessment. So I think they've probably done as best they can in this regard. Uh, question number eight, are objective and validated measurement methods used to measure the outcome? And if not, was the assessor blind? So the OSCE is a validated assessment tool. The examiner used a standardised marking rubric. The case was peer reviewed by the education committee and the examiner was blinded to the students group. So I think they did a pretty good job in that regard. Question number nine is, is a bit difficult. Is the size effect pra practically relevant? Because the size effect in this study is the difference in the performance and the scores between the two groups in the mock OSCE. And its relevance really depends on what you consider to be the purpose of the OSCE. Um, so the mock OSCE that is. If the purpose is to ensure that students meet a minimum standard of competency, so they achieve a pass grade or higher, then these results are not particularly relevant because all of the students in both groups passed. But if the purpose of the Mokoski is to, achieve, to um, uh, get the highest score possible and the highest banding possible, which may be useful um, on a medical school transcript for getting into subsequent training, for example, then it might be relevant that the students in the intervention group uh, did a little bit better um, on their quantitative score at the end of the day. Um, uh, in Australia, most medical schools use a non-graded pass system, so that wouldn't be particularly relevant and it wouldn't be particularly um, useful to get 2.7 points higher uh, on your on your Mokoski score if you passed, um, but in other places it might be more significant. And again, I guess we don't know its effect uh, on long-term outcomes. So um, it's one thing to say that they improved in what we measured here, which was their Mokoski score, but whether this actually had meaningful translation to practice is unclear. Um, Question number 10, how precise is the estimate of the effect and were confidence intervals given? Um, the, it's difficult to comment on the precision of the qualitative data. And for the quantitative data, the authors didn't provide a confidence interval for the group's means. They just gave a standard deviation. But my understanding is, and I'm happy to be corrected, but with a um, normally distributed data, 95% of the data will fall within two standard deviations of the mean. So that gives us a confidence interval of about six points or 5.8 points for both groups. And those confidence intervals do overlap. So I don't think it's particularly precise. Um, question number 11, could there be confounding factors that haven't been accounted for? Absolutely. So we don't know what students' baseline level of knowledge is. We don't know what their skills and competency were prior to this. Um, and then there might be factors aside from the teaching intervention that could have contributed to their Mokoski results. So whether or not they had more or less multidisciplinary team involvement during their rotation or clinical exposure to particular patients or family members in the setting of a delirium. Um, and we also don't know the temporal relationship of each group between when they had their delirium education and when they sat the mock OSCE. So there are certainly confounding factors here that could have influenced uh, the results. And finally, number 12, can these results be applied to your organisation? And thinking specifically about the proposed University of Toronto um, geriatrics rotation, I think there are some take home points that we will get to in the subsequent slides. Um, I've just noticed a comment in the chat by Irene about why not use special um, nurse specialists in both interventions or a geriatrician in both interventions and I agree. Um, I, if I was designing the study, I would have kept everything the same except the group OSCE. I wonder if perhaps it was a, a staffing um, a situation whereby if the clinical nurses at one school are running um, the group OSCE, they may as well give the, the tutorial beforehand. I don't know if the authors didn't explain it, but I think it would have been better if that small group teaching was more standardised across the two groups. Uh, so my take home points from this study in the broader context are that geriatrics focused simulation training for medical students is probably beneficial and worthwhile overcomes the opportunistic nature of clinical placements. There's no risk of harm to patients or their families and caregivers. 
and it may have a greater psychological safety than bedside teaching. And what I mean by that is students may be more prepared to participate. It's a safer environment in which for them to make mistakes. So the learning gains may be greater because they're more comfortable psychologically uh, in the group OSCE simulation session. Obviously, that's not the case for every student. Um, but often um, bedside tutorials with real patients and uh, you know, an experienced clinician can be a bit daunting for students who are relatively early in their training. In a more narrow context, um, the group OSCE is a novel type of simulation training that appears to be well suited for teaching medical students about delirium in a clinical context. And I think that the group OSCE can probably be used to teach medical students about other geriatric related conditions. So um, things like dementia or end of life care planning, for example. Uh, in terms of the strengths of the group OSCE, uh, it's, it's a reasonably efficient use of resources with a high student to facilitator ratio once it's established. It encourages interprofessional teaching, which is important in geriatrics. It provides opportunities for students to improve feedback literacy, which is really important for uh, lifelong learning. There are some limitations of the group OSCE, however, um, as mentioned, its effect upon long term knowledge retention and clinical practice is unknown. Uh, we don't know how satisfied the students and the facilitators were with the process. And it would have taken significant startup effort and planning to write this, um, the scenarios to train the simulated patients to explain to the students how the group OSCE works. So once established, it's probably quite easily repeatable, but it would take quite a lot of startup effort. So you're thinking about um, implications for the um, uh, geriatric medicine clerkship at U of T. I think we, we can consider incorporating the following into curriculum design here. Um, so simulation training is probably going to, to be useful um, and possibly the group OSCE or another type of simulation training. Um, interprofessional teaching opportunities are key. And while the authors have concluded that it was the group OSCE that made the difference, perhaps it was actually um, the nurse teaching that made the difference here and having that contact, that interdisciplinary contact. Um, Group and peer learning environments uh, can help to develop teamwork and feedback skills. And so mechanisms to incorporate them into a rotation or a program um, would, would probably be useful. And like with any uh, intervention, there needs to be a mechanism of, prog of program evaluation and feedback, which I believe is, is planning to be incorporated uh, into the clerkship. So that's all for my presentation. I have a slide at the end about medical training in Australia if if anyone is interested or relevant, but otherwise we can uh, open it for discussion and questions. Thank you very, very much. Uh, again, also beautifully uh, presented and, and uh, so relevant to our future uh, plans. Uh, thank you for that. Michael uh, Gordon has his hand up, but uh, prior, Michael, just one moment. Shabir uh, had a comment uh, in the chat box. Precision is guided by two main factors, intrinsic variability in the outcome and sample size. Here, the confidence intervals were relatively narrow, even if overlapping at extremes. My question related to item one, is there any downside to implementing this approach? Limitations notwithstanding versus our usual teaching approach. Uh, it is equally plausible that geriatrician training was better than the nurse. Uh, by the way, fantastic presentation. Um, yeah, so I think um, I think the the having the staff to run this and the space and the limitations practically would be a significant downside to this. When when you say item one was that with the um, critical appraisal slide with a clearly focused question? Yes, um, item twelve, yeah. the last item. Item oh item twelve, sorry. Um, right, can and it be, the applied? be applied? Yeah. it's really an extension yeah. of that. Um, yeah, so, so I think, um, I, I don't know that I'm necessarily a convert to specifically the group OSCE intervention, but I think there is definitely a role for simulation training and the medical school that I'm affiliated with in Australia runs simulation training for the students that do their geriatrics rotation and I think it's useful. Um, and your comment about the geriatrician training being better than nurse is absolutely plausible. We don't know. It could just be that, you know, it could be that the small group teaching was better in the control group. And if they both had teaching by the clinical nurse specialist, perhaps the difference would have been bigger. Yeah, that, that was kind of an, um, a confounding factor in, in these results, I think.
Thank you. Go ahead, Michael. Yeah, first of all, it really was a terrific uh, presentation, very cogent and uh, uh, well uh, expressed. Uh, um, a few things. I think in essence, I think the OSCE is a very good component of training. And I think a hybrid, which would include a formal didactic presentation, an OSCE, and then the experience on the clinical setting really is probably the optimal approach. Whether it's a nurse practitioner, geriatrician, I think it depends. Some nurse practitioners that I've worked with are outstanding teachers, and it's a matter of resource allocation. I feel that the OSCE component is very good, and we should look at it, and you mentioned it in your uh, um, conclusions. I think it should be expanded to at least the geriatric so-called giants, so that every medical student who's going to deal with, unless he's going to be a pediatrician, geri geriatric patient, which is almost all the rest, will have a good understanding of the foundational principles of geriatric care. Thanks a lot. I love your accent, by the way. <laughs> Thank you. Go ahead, Barry. Thank you, Dove. Um, fabulous presentation. And uh, just a, a, a couple of things I wanted to mention. One is when geriatrics started off, we beat ourselves up about the, the effectiveness of geriatric consultation services. Um, when nobody else had to prove that their consultation services were any good. So I just want to be careful that we don't present things as in, you know, in geriatric education that we don't know what we're doing and that we have to improve in comparison to others, because I don't think that's the case at all. And I, I just wanted to mention briefly the, the clerkship that I, or clinical training that I noted at the, the old Middlesex Hospital in London close to 40 years ago, where in, the, in that in their clerkship type of environment, it was all senior health discipline. So they had uh, medical students, uh, nurses in their final year, and therapists in their final year. I don't think they had social workers because they were in a different faculty. And they had some of their own didactic training and stuff. But when it came to patients' assessments, they worked together as a team. So a, a doctor, nurse, physio, OT, and had to come up with plans for the, the management of that patient. I thought it was a a fabulous way to teach geriatrics. Uh, so just something to think about. I think the group OSCE could quite easily be adapted to interprofessional learners. So, you know, you've got two student groups. Why not make it a medical student and a nursing student and an occupational therapy student all acting together in that undergraduate scenario as a team to come up and manage the patient? And they'll all have a different perspective. And that's actually what we do in clinical practice. So I think instilling that early on in medical students is important. Um, and I think having, having a simulation component to a rotation really does just mean that everyone will have a bit of exposure to it no matter what patients turn up on the ward. I mean, it's likely they will encounter a real patient with delirium on their rotation, but if they don't, at least they've had this experience um, to kind of guide them in the future. And I think it's particularly relevant um, in the Canadian medical training context because some of these students you know you, you go straight into residency in your specialty after medical school and if you yeah if you end up in surgery for example this may be your only formal teaching on delirium um in in australia we do, we have an internship year and residency years and your likelihood i think of encountering more patients um uh with geriatric conditions before your specialty training is higher but I think, I think it's really important it's included in the, the medical school curriculum. Yeah, thanks. And you, your comments are, are very well appreciated in terms of um, our future clerkship rotation where it will be uh, distributed broadly and not everyone will be exposed to a delirious patient, certainly not. They're not all gonna be hosted on inpatient medicine or um, uh, an, an inpatient service. So, so that... that uh, uh, very applicable. Go ahead, Marjorie. Hi. As a clinical nurse specialist in geriatrics for many decades, <laughs> I think that looking at things from a different model of education, and particularly in the interprofessional kind of framework, much of, uh, of the patients that actually have delirium uh, are, are kind of, uh, that people will stop me in the hall and say, Marjorie, can you please come in? I think this patient is off. And that we rely too heavily, I think, with the nursing education in the corporate delivery of these uh, um, 
on dementia and delirium. And yet there is very little attention made to enhance those clinical skills. We have a lot of new nurses. And if we don't get those patients referred to us uh, promptly, then there are just too many adverse events as a consequence of that. So any opportunity, um, educational opportunities uh, to enhance the identification in a more timely and interprofessional way, I'm in total support of. Thank you for those comments. And Michael, go ahead. Yeah, I think the comment about making sure everybody, no matter what specialty they're going to be involved with uh, in their careers, should have this exposure. And for many years, I used to do the pre-op consults and post-op care on the orthopedic ward at Mount Sinai, which, you know, most of the patients were elderly patients. And I would often get a request that said, Mrs. So-and-so had hip surgery yesterday, and she's confused today. She must have had a stroke. And the answer always was, she must have not had a stroke. What she has is gravelitis, morphinitis, in other words, a post-operative drug reaction. So I think everybody should be exposed, no matter what they're going to do, as I said, except for neonatology and pediatrics, should have a good foundational structure in their education, especially related to the big giants, including delirium. Thank you. And Anna, perhaps one more uh, question on the methods. Did the geriatrician have structured uh, teaching that included the elements that they were going to be assessed on? I know the group OSCE had feedback and, um, you know, standardized um, simulation for the elements that they were going to be evaluated on. Did the geriatrician-led teaching have the same content or structure? Uh, so we don't know. And the, the authors have just said that they just compared it to standard teaching, whatever standard teaching was. Right. So it's possible that depending on which geriatrician you're assigned to on the day, you know, or what how their teaching style was, that the students could have had different geriatrician-led teaching. We also don't know what the clinical nurse specialist teaching in the intervention group was, the small group teaching. But my, uh, my um, assumption would be that it would have probably fairly structured, given I think they were the same nurses that then run the group, ran, ran the group OSCE. So they probably would have had a set thing they went through with the students, but we don't know in the other group if it was the same geriatrician at each site for each group of students, whether they use the same format. It was just the, the point of the study was to compare it to standard teaching. And that was standard teaching, that it's just whatever they, they got on their rotation. Yeah. Thank you very much. We will uh, send along, I don't think they're on today, but our undergraduate curricular leads, uh, we will uh, bring this forward. I, I often say, um, Patricia uh, Gordon and Kazue Schmidt, who are the nurse specialists on our service, they've heard me teach delirium so often that I say they could likely deliver it better than uh, me. Uh, and uh, this might uh, uh, offer uh, some support. Anyways, thank you very, very much uh, to both of our uh, fellows for wonderful presentations and very rich uh, discussion. Uh, I wanna also thank uh, Vicki uh, Chow and the group at uh, UHN Sinai for hosting such wonderful uh, fellows. Um, and uh, the evaluation for today's uh, session was sent about 10 minutes ago. Please do uh, complete them and an announcement for our upcoming Geriatric Medicine a Virtual Research Day on uh, Wednesday, May the 24th. If you have uh, trainees or learners with abstracts, please encourage them to submit for our annual Virtual Research uh, Day. Many thank yous in the uh, chat. It's the top of the hour 